Here we find our traveler waking up, not knowing what he is about to find. Huh? Where am I? Why, you're standing at the entrance to the mythical land of metacognition, also known as Metaland. Wait, who's there? Why, I'm the gatekeeper to the land of metacognition. Metacognition? What's that? Well, metacognition is known as the knowledge about and regulation of one's cognitive activities and learning processes. There are two parts to metacognition, that is metacognition knowledge and metacognition regulation. Metacognition knowledge is knowledge about the cognitive process. Specifically, this knowledge can consist of knowing what factors affect one's own performance, different strategies, and what different strategy to use for a given situation. Hmm, interesting. So what is metacognif metacognition regulation? Metacognition regulation involves the use of metacognitive strategies. Specifically, this consists of setting goals, monitoring and controlling one's learning, and assessing one's own performance. Wait, hold on, I don't understand exactly what you mean. Okay, here's an example. Say a person is reading some text from a paragraph. Their goal is to understand the text. After reading the paragraph, the person may ask themselves about what was discussed in the paragraph. This is a strategy called self-questioning. If the person can't answer their own question, they need to figure out what they need to do to answer this question and hence understand that part of the text. The person may choose to go back and read the paragraph again with the objective to answer their own question. If after reading the paragraph, they can answer their own question, the person can confirm that they understand the text. Oh, I see. So that's what regulation is. Mm-hmm. And that's what metacognition is. Wow, metacognition sounds pretty interesting. Can you tell me more? Unfortunately, that is the extent of my knowledge on metacognition. Beyond the gate, you will find many people who know more about metacognition. Enter the gate if you seek that knowledge. Oh, well, I guess I got nothing to lose. Now the traveller enters the gate. Hello there, traveller. Have you ever thought about the difference between thinking about thinking and just thinking? Uh, wait, thinking about thinking about thinking? Yeah, differentiating between cognition and metacognition is important to your journey through the land of metacognition. It can be difficult to distinguish between the two concepts, as they are closely related. Each relies on the other to be effective. Cognition is the process of acquiring knowledge and understanding. For example, learning, remembering and understanding a certain topic. Metacognition, as you learned just before, relies on an awareness and control of your cognitive processes. For example, knowledge of your cognitive shortcomings in learning a foreign language. Okay, so I need to have acquired some previous knowledge in a subject area, some cognitions, before I can form effective metacognitive strategies. Yes, exactly. Your metacognitive ability relies on previous cognitive abilities to function well. Metacognitive knowledge relies on cognitions within the relevant area. For example, you need to know a little bit of prior knowledge about a subject for you to know your strengths and weaknesses in that particular subject. Metacognitive skills such as planning, monitoring evalu and evaluating all rely on cognitive activities such as problem solving and sequencing steps. Think of cognitions as a vehicle for, for metacognition, however their reliance on each other is cyclical as metacognition relies on cognitions and effective cognitions in learning rely on developed metacognitive skills and knowledge. Oh, thanks for clearing that up. I'll be on my way. Now the traveller continues on his way, finding a teacher. Hello. I was wondering if you could teach me about learning and metacognition. Yes, I can do that. Well, how does the concept of metacognition affect the work you do as a teacher? Metacognition refers to enhancing self-awareness of what one believes and how one knows. As a teacher, the more I can teach students to be creatively and actively thinking as they learn, the more learning efficiency they will get. Metacognitive skills can help students to figure out which element they understand and which they don't. Therefore, it's important for us to cultivate the development of metacognitive skills 
in students. This skill can help students to not only think about what they know, but also managing how they go about learning. So, how do you develop the metacognitive abilities of your students? There are three processes involved in developing metacognitive skills. Firstly, teaching students that their learning ability not only changes, but that they can affect how the ability develops. Secondly, helping them to make study plan and set goals. And thirdly, giving students opportunity to monitor and guide their learning and adapt their own learning plans. Okay, so it sounds like a student with a highly developed metacognitive skills can manage their study productively and achieve better performance. Is there any example for me to understand these processes well? Of course, yes. Imagine you are a skilled professional ballet dancer and a trainer, and one day you have to teach your student in a dance studio without a mirror. What will you feel? Well, that's really hard because the students cannot see what their performance will look like and what they are doing as they dance. You are right. The mirror can help ballet dancers to judge their shape of movements and also have the situational awareness of, what the, of where the other dancers are. Dancers can improve their performance through the mirror. However, if the mirror is removed, it's not easy for them to crack their position and create the desired shapes with their body. Okay, so the mirror is important for a beginner to learn, but do the students have the mirror while learning? In my example, this mirror is a process of stepping back to see what you are doing, as if your friend were watching it. Specifically, let the student to become an audience for their own intellectual performance. It can guide students' learning and improve their learning planning self-evaluation and monitoring. How do you let your students learn as much as possible? Well, as an educator, I put a lot of thought into how to make my class and the material as accessible and engaging as possible. I think about what I know and how I first learned it. How did I teach this before? What worked and didn't work? Also, I think about what my students already know and how to apply this knowledge to reality. Okay, well, thanks very much. Our traveler while traveling happens upon a strange bush. Hey, looks like you're in for a treat. Uh, wait, who, who are you? Because I'm in teaching you about the difference in connections between metacognition and intellectual skills. Wait, uh, aren't they the same thing? No! Not at all. Simply put, intelligence is what you think and metacognition is how you think. But it goes a bit deeper than that. Intelligence is the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills, whereas metacognitive processes involve looking at the how. Take for instance, something simple as learning how to add two numbers. You examine two numbers and how they interact when added, and you learn this process and how to apply it. Metacognition looks at this whole process from an outside perception. It's crazy stuff. Okay, so how do we see the connection between intelligence and metacognition? Well, there are theories out there which describe this connection. A widely agreed theory is the fact that metacognition and intelligence are completely separate entities. Explained simply, this would mean that anyone with a lower intellectual ability attempted metacognitive functions, they would not be hindered by their intellectual capacity. So all in all, yes, there are differences between intelligence and metacognition. But there is also can be a level of connection between the two, particularly when some definitions, such as Sternberg's, define one aspect of intelligence as capitalising on strengths or correcting or compensating for weaknesses. This ability to correct weaknesses and use your strengths is strongly linked to your metacognitive skills. Well, thanks. I understand this better now. Well, good luck in your travels. After his experience with the Bushman, our traveler stumbles upon a house. Hi. I just wanted to ask you a few questions about what, what the... the uh, who are you? More importantly, get off my lawn. Wait, please. I just wanted to ask a few questions and then I'll leave. Fine. What do you want to know? Well, 
How is emotion related to metacognition? In order to understand how metacognition relates to emotion, we need to consider Nelson and Naren's model of metacognition, where human thought is split into two levels, the primary and secondary level. The primary level is what the person is thinking about, and the secondary level is what the person thinks about the primary thoughts, or the metacognitive thoughts. Okay, so how does this help us? Thoughts on a metacognitive level that were triggered by the primary level thoughts can affect the person's emotions. For example, consider a situation where a person is asked to recall a moment where they experience success. In this situation, the metacognitive thoughts will cause the person to experience the positive emotions associated with those moments, such as happiness and confidence. Similarly, recalling a situation that ended in a failure would result in feelings of negativity, such as sadness, lack of confidence and frustration. So thinking about a sad situation makes you sad, and thinking about a happy situation makes you happy. It's pretty obvious, why should I care about this? What is important for us is when things work the other way around. A person's emotional state can affect their metacognitive thoughts, which in turn can affect the primary thoughts. Research has shown that a person's mood can influence aspects of how they think and perceive things. It has been shown that a person's thoughts can be manipulated using their emotions. Now for why this is important, you have probably been in a situation where you are trying to study while you are angry or sad. In this situation, you will find it difficult to absorb, process and learn information as your metacognitive thoughts are being affected by your emotions. In a positive emotional state, your mind will be free to think about and process what you are learning, how you are learning, and basically everything the other guys told you about. In a negative emotional state, your metacognitive thoughts will tend to revolve around your emotions. For example, someone who is frustrated by their schoolwork may find themselves thinking, what is the point of this? Why do I need to learn this? Rather than what they are supposed to be learning. Okay, so maintaining positive emotions is also important to learning. That's exactly right. Studying well upset Frustrated or otherwise will be will tend to be less effective than when you're in neutral mood. Now get off my lawn. Aww. Now our traveller is contemplating what he has learned while sailing upon a raft on a river, thinking about his thinking. Wow! Looks like I've learned quite a bit about how we think. I guess it's time to go home. <laughs>